benvenuti in questo convegno internazionale che l'Accademia uh, ha pianificato, auspicato ormai da molto tempo. Mi sembra di ricordare che alla, alla, nella tua presidenza già si era parlato di questo e sono molto felice che finalmente oggi e domani mattina si realizzi questo convegno estremamente qualificato, estremamente articolato e perciò il mio dovere qui e piacere è quello di darvi il benvenuto. Io non sono uno storico per cui non mi inoltro certamente negli argomenti che verranno trattati ma sono molto felice di poter ascoltarvi. Eh, vi posso dire solo perché eh, fin dal primo momento eh, mi ha incuriosito e interessato molto questo convegno. Io sono un appassionato lettore di Gadda e mi ha molto colpito eh, in Gadda, che poi sarà trattato anche nel corso di questa giornata, quella, questa frase del suo taccuino che dice, lo qui sono due parole, e di questa esperienza che tra l'altro cade esattamente oggi, se non riesco, e ieri e, e poi oggi la cattura, perciò è veramente un giorno in qualche modo, non so se è stato pensato così. Pensato, sì. Ah, beh, allora, se è stato pensato in questo, no, pensavo fosse pensato la settimana, ma addirittura il giorno. Come si è riuscito a trovare il giorno? Eh, benissimo, benissimo. Diceva appunto questa, questa frase che mi aveva molto colpito. Finiva così la nostra vita di soldati e di bravi soldati. Finivano i sogni più belli, le speranze più generose dell'adolescenza con la visione della patria straziata, con la nostra vergogna di vinti, iniziammo il calvario della dura prigionia, della fama, dei maltrattamenti, della miseria e del subizio. E questo mi ha un po', non dico interessato, ma certamente mi ha colpito molto. E allora sono andato a, a leggermi il solo libro che ho letto di storia su questa Cosa, che è il libro di uno dei relatori, diciamo, di questa giornata, che è La Grande Guerra, eh, di, di Snenghi Rochà, che poi è un libro del 2000, credo, se non ricordo male. E di questo libro mi ha colpito, proprio per cercare di, così, di, di comunicarvi il mio interesse di in una persona assolutamente incompetente, mi ha colpito che cosa? Mi ha colpito una, eh, una frase o due frasi eh, che, che, che vi leggo perché mi auguro, almeno auguro a me stesso che oggi con tutti gli aggiornamenti diciamo, che ci sono stati su questo versante non dico che possa avere una risposta ma possa ascoltare qualcosa di pertinente. Per l'accertamento di quel che è veramente è avvenuto in quell'angolo di monti ai bordi d'Italia non basteranno decenni di attenzioni e scrupoli filologici, tanto più che al termine dei suoi itinerari la filologia rischia di vedersi sfarinare sotto gli occhi e l'oggetto della ricerca. Una volta infatti accertato che non vi fu macchinazione politica e che si tratta di una normale sconfitta militare, Ciò che rischia di dissolversi è proprio l'alone immaginifico che circonda e rende da subito incomparabile questa sconfitta. Eh, quelli ottobre-novembre 1917, cioè cent'anni fa, eh, postula un'irruzione in dose massiccia del virtuale, non come assoluto non senso, e attività visionaria allo stato puro, ma come affioramento di strati profondi, di postulate e immagini sociali che non da ora regolano i rapporti fra ufficiali e soldati, destre e sinistre, laici e cattolici, cittadini consapevoli e masse agnostiche, 
città e campagna e via seguitando in una molteplicità di coppie oppositive a loro volta intrecciate e sovrapposte, che sentendosi membro a qualunque livello della classe dirigente soffre caporetto come una spia di un malessere radicale, può essere portata a razionalizzare la rotta della seconda armata come l'esito in suo modo naturale di tutta la storia dell'Italia unitaria. Di qui il panico. I contadini, mai integrati nelle sorti della nazione, presentano forse oggi il conto. La società si rivolta allo Stato. L'Italia reale si sottrae al controllo dell'Italia legale. E così, voglio dire, non, non continuo naturalmente, sono parole che oggi hanno, secondo me, una rilevanza notevole. Perciò il mio piacere è di accogliervi tutti e di ringraziare non solo voi che siete qui presenti, ma anche i relatori che mi auguro, ma questo è un augurio prudente personale, sempre con quell'incompetenza di cui vi dico che alcuni di questi punti che sono descritti qui, non dico vengano risolti, ma almeno vengono sviluppati per gli ascoltatori, quale sono io che voglio solo imparare e basta. Con ciò do la parola a chi presiederà questa... No, 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 no non ho bisogno, no, grazie. E per dare non solo ulteriore benvenuto, ma per raccontare la trama di questa giornata e forse anche quella di domani. Adesso non non so. Grazie comunque anche al professor e anche Zunino, ma vabbè, vabbè, ringrazio tutti, il professor, il professor Zunino, il professor, tutti quelli che hanno contribuito all'organizzazione di questa giornata, due giornate anche, assolutamente interessanti, mi vado a sedere nell'altro posto. Grazie. Grazie Presidente per queste tue parole, per questi ringraziamenti. Eh, questo è il terzo convegno che l'Accademia dedica alla Prima Guerra Mondiale, eh, ce ne sarà ancora un, uno ulteriore l'anno prossimo, l'anno della, della vittoria, insomma, della fine della guerra e eh, quest'anno naturalmente il 17 non poteva che essere dedicato a Caporetto, che, che è certamente l'evento più importante di tutta la la guerra per quel che riguarda il nostro paese e che è ancora oggi a cento anni esatti di distanza perché è alle 8 del mattino eh, di ieri, cent'anni fa, che la quattordicesima armata guidata dal generale tedesco von Belof, che era composta da, prevalentemente da divisioni tedesche insieme ad altre austriache, eh, partì all'attacco e eh, ruppe pochi giorni il fronte italiano praticamente distruggendo la seconda armata e costringendo eh, tutto il resto dell'esercito a ritirarsi prima dietro il tagliamento e poi infine dietro il piave. E, il professor Zunino che è stato il principale organizzatore con un po' di aiuto mio ma insomma è lui che ha pensato questo convegno e ha voluto ehm, vedere le vicende di Caporetto eh, attraverso molteplici aspetti, il ruolo degli alleati, la parte militare, ma anche eh, i ruoli politici, e fino a, ad arrivare, e lo sentiremo domani, all'intervento del professor Marazzini, che è il presidente dell'Accademia della Crusca, e che ci parlerà delle infinite Caporetto, insomma, del... del la valenza linguistica ecco, di questo termine che, che è diventata nella nostra lingua non soltanto più sinonimo di una battaglia, che non è soltanto più un riferimento di una battaglia persa, ma il sinonimo di ogni catastrofe, di ogni eh, sconfitta eh, definitiva. Ecco, per fare questo abbiamo avuto la fortuna di poter avere con noi alcuni fra i massimi specialisti che in questi anni hanno studiato le vicende della battaglia e tutto quello che sono intorno, in particolare 
Qui vicino a me c'è il professor John Gucce, che ringrazio molto per aver accettato il nostro invito. Il professor Gucce è professore all'Università di Leeds in Inghilterra, eh, è stato direttore del Journal of Strategic Studies ed è autore di importantissimi eh, importantissime ricerche di storia militare, fra cui mi limito a citare soltanto alcuni dei più importanti volumi che lui ha pubblicato, a partire da quello che in italiano, nella traduzione italiana, si intitola Soldati e Borghesi nell'Europa moderna, che è stato tradotto dalla terza nel 1982, e i due che il professor Gucci ha dedicato specificamente alle vicende militari del nostro paese, eh, Mussolini and his generals, Cambridge University Press 2007, anche questo tradotto in italiano, eh, la cui originale documentazione ha portato contributi importanti per riconsiderare molti aspetti della guerra itero-etiopica e recentissimo pubblicato nel 2014, sempre presso la Cambridge University Press, l'Italian Army in the First World War, quindi proprio il tema che discuteremo in queste due giornate, che lo è già ma che lo sarà destinato sempre di più a diventare opera di, di riferimento per la storia dell'Italia nella Grande Guerra. Eh, il professor Gucci affronta un tema che forse diciamo, nella polemica, nell'analisi delle polemiche virulentissime che ci sono state sulla responsabilità dei vari generali è stato un po' dimenticato dagli studiosi e storici italiani ma che è importantissimo e cioè il ruolo che hanno avuto gli alleati, perché noi eravamo alleati con la, con la Francia, con l'Inghilterra, con gli Stati Uniti e, e nella vicenda di Caporetto. In particolare il titolo del suo intervento è Uncertain Allies, England, France and the Road to Caporetto. I would like to thank the Academy for inviting me and the University. It's my first visit to Turin. And when I was invited, I thought uh, about what subject could I explore because I like exploring things rather than just repeating them, that had been little looked at. And one of those aspects is the aspect that I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon. I have written a paper, but as I get older, I prefer to talk rather than to read, so most of what I will do will probably be talking, which I hope is acceptable to you. And the subject is one that is almost unwritten about in English, French, or Italian works of history. And that is how particularly the military, because it was the armies who were engaged in the fighting, how the military of Britain and France saw Italy, what kind of potential partner they thought she was, and how did they react to her. So that is what I'm going to talk about for probably, what, the next half an hour, President? Is that about right? Mezzora? Okay. This is what things were supposed to be like, an ideal partnership of equals, but this is a little more like what things were actually like. Here is General Joffre apparently talking and Cadorna listening. And that begins to reflect the first basic theme of my paper, which is that this is an unbalanced alliance. But let me say one or two words about that alliance. The diplomatic side of it has been extensively covered by Italian historians, I think particularly of Luca Riccardi's work, which is a masterpiece. Uh, but the overall nature of that alliance, I think, has been remarkably little explored. So, first of all, I would like to put to you two things that strike me about the alliance as it existed between Britain, France, Italy, and Russia uh, in the First World War. The first is that we must not either deliberately or accidentally conflate it with the alliances that we know of the Second World War, the alliances of the democracies. Why? Because there were no deep, shared, pre-war interests between any of the partners. 
In fact, there was a great deal of conflict between those partners. So there was no, no overarching commitment of the kind, no overarching agreement on fundamentals as there was of the kind there was in the Second World War. Instead, there was a commitment to winning the war, but that covered a great many different ideas in different parts of the partnership. So I think that's the first point that one has to bear in mind about this alliance and about how Italy was seen in it. The second one, I begin to think is at least as important, if not more important, but is being much less addressed, partly because it's not easy to address. And that is that what I call the specificities of each partner, by which I mean its population, its culture, and its geopolitical goals, were often seen by the other members of the partnership as obstacles to winning the war and not as aids to winning the war. So one part of the argument that underlines this paper is that those fundamental factors were never truly grappled with and taken into account. In fact, as you will see fairly shortly, particularly, I'm afraid, as far as the British were concerned, a great many cultural prejudices came into play. So that's the first thing I want to say about this strange alliance. The second is that we have to think that 1917, when it opened, had been preceded by two years of unresolved differences and of unconclusive fighting, both on the Western Front and here in Italy. And what I think that did was to invigorate, to strengthen pre-existing doubts and suspicions, especially, though not only, about Italy. So that if we look at the general attitude of the British Foreign Office early in 1917, it has been described as, by an Italian historian, as, and I think he is right, as one of barely concealed contempt. Marquis Imperiali in London wrote in his diary, talked with Harding, the uh, Foreign Office Mandarin, quite definitely his indecisive and snooty attitude tries my patience dearly. So there were prejudices operating in London. In Paris, at the beginning of 1917, the impression gained ground that Italy would never get beyond the Alpine barrier and that the bulk of the Italian army was sitting behind it unused because that was the way the Italians wanted it. That was what Paris thought, or rather what the Italian representative reported uh, that she thought. So I'm going to talk about the military alliance, and I'm going to talk about it in two respects. First of all, the strategic differences that existed and how they were or were not resolved. And I will give you one part of the, the answer, as it were, at this point in time. If this story has a hero, it is Foch, as far as the Italians are concerned. But I will explain that later on. So, at the Chantilly Conference in, Jan in December 1915, it was decided that Germany was to be defeated either on the Western Front or on the Russian Front by simultaneous coordinated offensives. What happened next? Perhaps the most important thing that happened next, although that is always a dangerous thing for any historian to say, perhaps the most important thing that happened next was the gradual collapse of Russia as a key plank in that strategy. And that happened quite quickly, because at the end of December 1916, the Russian Stavka, the Russian general staff, said it was not going to follow the Shanti strategy. It was not going to take part in common offensives on the East and Western Front. It 
was going to attack when it could on the southwestern front in the Balkans. And then almost immediately, of course, the Russian army began to collapse. Now this potentially raised a question about Italy's place in the alliance. If Russia is weakening, then that might be supposed to make Italy look a more important partner from the point of view of Paris and London. But it did not. Far from raising Italy's profile within the alliance, the collapse of Russia made her appear more of a liability. And at the Paris conference on the 4th of May 1917, Britain and France agreed that it was essential to continue offensive operations on the Western Front. Why? So as not to give the enemy the opportunity of attacking Russia or Italy. In other words, Italy is seen as as much a weak partner, or almost as much a weak partner, strategically as Russia is in May 1917. Uh, now, there were two attempts in the first half of 1917 to try to upgrade Italy's status in the alliance. And they both failed. The first, I'm sure some, many, perhaps all of you will know a little about, and that is the Rome Conference in January 1917, at which Lloyd George tried to persuade his own generals to launch a great and sudden stroke against the enemy, as he put it. And that idea of raising Italy's status in the alliance collapsed almost immediately. It collapsed because about 10 days later, on the 16th of January 1917, the British War Cabinet decided to support the coming Nivelle Offensive. And essentially, uh, the paper, which I think perhaps may be published, uh, the paper gives a series of further examples, but I think I can leave this part of the story by saying that as far from that moment, indeed before that moment, as far as the British and all of the French, with one exception, were concerned, the Western Front was the front that mattered. There was a second attempt to try to change the focus of Allied strategy towards Italy. That first one was in January. The second was on the 1st of March, 1917. And that was when Leonida Bisolati appeared in front of the British War Cabinet and told them of Italy's worries about being attacked from the Trentino by the Austrians and perhaps the Germans. The British cabinet records say that the British government or its representatives feared that there would be another debacle of the kind that had happened in Romania. Now that tells us something about what the cabinet's view was, I'm afraid, as to the value of Italy. But the soldiers simply would not listen. Effectively, we can say that strategy was tied to the Western Front, both because of the Nivelle Offensive in April 1917, and then later on, of course, because of the Passchendaele Offensive in July and a revived French offensive at Verdun. The only person I can find of authority among senior Allied commanders in chief who were prepared to take those Italian fears seriously was Foch. Why Foch? Well, first of all, I think Foch had a much wider strategic vision than anybody else, particularly uh, Sir William Robertson. When I was a very young man, I started my work on British military history, and Sir William Robertson was one of my uh, infantile heroes. He is not now. Um, he's been replaced by Foch. So 
So, Foch was able to do something really very modern. He was able to assess risk strategy. And one of the reasons that he was able to do that was because Foch was prepared to take more seriously the intelligence appreciations that he was getting from uh, Italy being brought back to him or sent back to him. The British did not believe those intelligence uh, estimates and that is one of the reasons why the British always held Italy at arm's length. I have to say that this is one of these almost unexplored realms of First World War history that we have to do a lot more digging in, although it is not easy um, because intelligence history uh, is not the easiest of subjects. Anyway, Foch then looked at the problem and told his government that this, the Italian front, was one of the weakest points in the, in the ally, alliance. Le danger italien existe donc, he told Nivelle. Something must be done to meet it in case it was necessary to help the Italians. And one of Foch's strengths was that he was prepared to accommodate the Italians' perceptions and take them as a risk. Robertson never did. The British general staff never did. Um, nobody has really looked at risk analysis, but I think as I look a little bit at it, the British general staff were really not very good at risk analysis. Foch seems to have been remarkably unusually good at it. Well, um, there was a lot of pressure, as I'm sure all of you know, from Cadorna to get men and guns over to the Italian front. He was fighting this strategic priority. Uh, he was also fighting the perceptions and I'll say a word about those in a moment, of the British and the French. And he met Cadorna at Udine on the 23rd of March, 1917. After that meeting, the British reports say that as far as Robertson was concerned, the Italian position, the worry about an attack, was all simply guesswork. Hypothesis is the word used in the British papers. And Robertson was a practical soldier and would have nothing to do with hypothesis. And what is interesting is that Colonel Maxime Vagon was also at that conference representing Foch. And he reported that the Italian view of the danger rested upon mere hypothèse, suppositions. And his report ends thus. Il est impossible de faire entendre raison aux Italiens à ce sujet. You can't make the Italians see reason on this subject. So that was the attitude of both the British and the French high commands. Uh, I shall not tell any more of this story uh, because it is a series of, of debates and discussions in which Foch is the most important member, which eventually leads at Vicenza on the 8th of April 1917, to Cadorna getting that undertaking that he wanted. There would be guns, there would be men, four divisions, Bosch offered him, if and when France needed them. So what I want to do now is go on and, having rather hastily overseen the strategic dimensions of the British and French view, I want to look at the second, and to me, as important dimension, and the one that's virtually unexplored. Because British and French relations with military Italy were certainly constrained inside what I call a straitjacket of strategic priorities, but they were also shaped by perceptions of what the Italian army could and could not do and therefore what role it could be expected to perform. So this is where two people, almost unexplored in history so far, become rather important. And this is the first one. 
This is Brigadier General Sir Charles Delmay Radcliffe. Um, I, shall try, I shall try a joke in Italian. Uh, Dicono da noi in Inghilterra che se uh, Delmay Radcliffe avesse avuto un medaglia in più non avrebbe potuto stare in piedi perché ce ne sono tanti, there are so many. Um, the important thing about Delmay Radcliffe was that he had been military attaché in Rome before the First World War, and he seems to have developed a very close, insofar as you can say this, a very close relationship with Vittorio Emanuele Terzo. And his wife was apparently a very good friend of the Queen. Um, and if any of you are interested in Vittorio Emanuele Terzo, um, there are some rather important letters in Delmay Radcliffe's papers, which are in the Imperial War Museum, in which he reports at length confidential discussions, conversations, uh, by Vittorio Emanuele Terzo. So it is one of the most interesting sources on the role of the king about which we still know very little. Uh, and about which there's a lot more to learn. So, what does... I, I think Delmay Radcliffe is a courtier, uh, essentially. Um, I wonder whether that's perhaps why he appealed to Vittorio Emanuele Terzo. I don't think, having done the research for this paper, that he's actually a very good military analyst either, unlike his French compatriot, who we will come to in a few moments. But what does Delmay Radcliffe say? He's very well connected. He reports the views of the king. He reports the views of Cadorna. He reports the views of the Commando Supremo. And he reports views of many, but not always, many conservative Italian politicians. What does he say? He tells London at the end of 1916 in a general survey that Italy is a timid and dependent country in which official communications tend to magnify difficulties. He tells London that the political arena is volatile and unstable, being subject to the untiring and unceasing machinations of enemy influences. He tells London that some members of the government were weak in characteristically Italian fashion. I was embarrassed when I read that, but that's in the document. Sonino was one of his problems. He was just obstructive. And um, Orlando was another of his problems, as he reported them to London. Orlando was too inert. Orlando was not doing enough about Joseph Cayo, who was very active in Rome at the beginning of 1917. Orlando was not doing enough about Titone. Orlando was not doing enough about the Giolitiani. In fact, Delmay Radcliffe tells Lloyd George, these people are a really serious danger at the moment, a much greater danger than anything the enemy might do. Um, to summarise what Delmay Radcliffe says about the Italian army and the Italian military, I've gone through almost all the reports he wrote in 1917 and, and a lot of the reports he wrote in 1916. What he tends to do is simply report Cadorna's view, report the Commando Supremo's ideas about the situation. He virtually never analyzes them. He reports weaknesses Weaknesses in the training of officers, weaknesses generally in the way that the mass of the army was fighting, uh, weaknesses in the artillery. He's not an artillery man. He does not analyse these things. What he does do is tend to um, put a general label over the Italian army, which cannot have helped Italy's cause in London. It is not wise, he writes, to expect the same fighting value from Italian troops as from British, French or German troops. The race is a less tough and determined one. 
and its combatant value must, in reason, be assessed at a considerable percentage below that of the British, French or German races. Well, I suppose all you can say is that he was a man of his time and his class and his culture and that certainly reflected this. But in general, Delmay Radcliffe's reports about the battles in May 1917 and again in August 1917 were extremely positive. Reports come back to London at the beginning of August 1917 of the troubles in the Italian army. The indiscipline, uh, Petiti Roreto's shooting of some soldiers. Uh, they come back from somebody else. Delmay Radcliffe reassures London. Such unsatisfactory behaviour is quite unusual in the great body of the Italian army. The army is fighting with great determination. Troop morale is excellent and the prospects are very good. All you have to think is that that is what was in London's mind when on the 24th of October or the 25th of October 1917 they learned about the sudden collapse. So, enough about Delmay Radcliffe, an interesting and important figure. The other interesting and important figure is this man. This man is the head of the French military mission General de Gondecourt. This is the only known photograph of de Gondrecourt, and uh, we know almost nothing about him, mainly because people have not yet dug deep enough into the archives. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. One of the important differences between how the British army approached Italy as an alliance and how the French approached Italy was that the French had an outlook. And the outlook was that all their allies, British in 1916, Italians in 1917, Americans in 1918, did not understand industrialized warfare. They were not meeting the challenges. The French believed that they were. So the French approach was to set about trying to teach the Italians. Uh, if I were to put it very simply, they were trying to teach the Italians to be more like Frenchmen, uh, which may or may not be a good idea. I'm not going to say. So, um, we find much more detailed analysis in de Gondra's reports of what was going wrong, technically what was going wrong with Italian artillery. What was going wrong with training? And particularly, uh, what was going wrong with the command system? Uh, de Gondrecourt writes a report about the May 1917 battles, and it is practically a lesson on how not to fight a battle. It describes all the mistakes that the French see as being made a command system in which Cadorna does nothing very much, in which his core commanders are inactive and leave the job to the divisional commanders, in which the divisional commanders leave it to the brigade commanders, and in which the brigade commanders throw their troops in, one after another, in no proper strategic or tactical order, while, as de Gondrecourt says, the staff sit back behind the lines with their arms crossed as if they were spectators in the battle. So this is what is being reported back to London and back to Paris. The impression in London, as I've said from Delmay Radcliffe's reports, is that even though there are some shortcomings in the Italian army. Basically, the army can fight and will fight, and if, as Delmay Radcliffe says in one report, if everything is organized and arranged properly, it will fight successfully. And that is how he forecasts the outcome of the battle that was due to begin 
uh, in October. The French have a very much more pessimistic view on the eve of Caporetto about the Italian army. As far as artillery commanders are concerned, de Gondacourt writes to, London, to Paris, two years of trench warfare have taught them nothing about the employment of their arm. Cadorna seems to have no idea of manoeuvring his armies. Capello tried to do too much himself uh, in August 1917. Only one corps commander, says de Gondrecourt, really achieved anything, Armando Diaz. So, the French are trying to get the Italians to learn by example and are failing more or less, uh, by October 1917. The British are not even trying very hard to give the Italians an example. And the reporting in London is all very positive. Well, let me come towards the conclusion of my paper and talk very briefly about what happened um, at the end of September and then October 1917. So, Cadorna, in August 1917, gets some guns. And imme almost immediately, he announces that he is not going to carry on with the offensive for which he had been given them, but he is going to wait for an enemy offensive. That stunned de Gondrecourt, who wrote a, a very, um, not an angry report, but a very concerned report back. He talks about seeing General Porro uh, on the evening of the 20th September. Porro calls him in. Porro tells him there is going to be no offensive. De Gondrecourt says this will create an unfortunate effect in France. And this is what the document quotes. That's true, Porro replied, but a setback would have an even more unfortunate effect on the country's morale. Incidentally, and nobody seems on the Allied side, side to care for Porro very much, uh, but de Gondrecourt thought that his pessimism was un très habituel de son caractère, an habitual way he thought about things. So London is stunned by the announcement that there will be no offensive. Robertson has given some guns and asks for them back again. And then... Uh, Slightly mollified, he does allow uh, Cadorna to keep 20 of them. He sent 64, French have sent 100, uh, he gets all but 20 back again. Delmay Radcliffe reports uh, very positively that Cadorna has 3,120 guns, 4,750 rounds of ammunition. The situation looks reasonably secure. This is a sentence... Uh, uh, that jumps out of, the, out of the papers. Whatever happens, Delmay Radcliffe tells London on the eve of Caporetto, whatever happens, the Austrian forces are certain to lose very heavily. And that is also more or less what de Gondrecourt uh, says. Well, the finale, and almost the end of my paper. The news of Caporetto arrives in London. The news, I think, as far as Robertson is concerned, you could say, is a shock, but not a surprise. It is a shock because it was not expected, but not a surprise uh, because of the tone of the reporting about uh, morale that he has been receiving. Foch was much, and, and Robertson thought and says uh, in fact, on the day after Caporetto, the Italians would be all right if the troops but fought moderately well, which speaks to the way he saw Italians. Foch agreed, yes, Cadorna could stand the offensive if he knows how to play his resources, but, and this is a crucial intervention by Foch, Foch tells Robertson that events dominate reason. In other words, 
You have to think of the situation actually as it is, not of your preconceptions about strategy. And, says Foch, it is in the Allies' interests to prevent the Italian disaster from growing at all costs, and so we must support the Italian army both morally and materially. And that is, of course, what they did. Well, we all know what happened after the 24th of October. We know about perhaps Codorna's finest hour, uh, his fighting retreat back to the Piave. But there's one last piece in this jigsaw that I want to put in place before I finish. Because as the Italian army was coming to rest on the Piave, as I would say, it was essentially saving itself uh, at that point in time, Robertson began to wonder, in print, whether Italy had a future as a member of the alliance. She has suffered a great disaster, he writes. Whether she will be able to recover from it is very doubtful. Men, guns, and aircraft were on their way, but the Allies had to avoid throwing good money after bad. And then Robertson builds one of these logical pyramids that end up somewhere in the sky. If the Germans attacked in the West, and if they attacked the French, whose government was very weak, then Great Britain would have to support both the French and the Italians. And if that happened, Robertson says, the British would have to consider cutting their losses if the task of saving not merely Italy, but the Italian army, seems likely to be beyond our powers. Well, it doesn't really quite happen like that, does it? Because in March 1918, the British army comes very close to having a caporetto all of its own, although that is not something that most British military historians would yet acknowledge. And the British army is saved by the French, not the other way round. And the Italian army does not need any more propping up by March 1918. But, alas, the effect of Caporetto lives on. It lives on in the mentality of both allies, but particularly the British ally. And the old belief, that well-tried, well-repeated belief, Italiani sunt imbeles, seems to be given an even longer half-life after Caporetto. Will it ever die? I hope so, but I don't know. Thank you. Thank you.